Um, we can go ahead and hit it. Hit it. Yeah. Updated. This one, I got it off the desk over there. For some reason, I don't have it on my laptop. I thought it did. But. Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Now we'll proceed into the work session. It's Monday, January 11th, 2021, 4.30 p.m. City Hall, Thomas J. Smith, Council Chambers, at, right here at 400 Washington Street. First up on the discussion items, which we've changed our format around, Leo, you might notice the discussion comes first to try to respect our guests. First up will be the Tiger update, Leo Foley. Thank you. Leo Foley, Veenster and Kim. Okay. Let's see if I can get this in here. So everybody's very well aware we bid the Tiger project in October. We got just one bidder, and we got a very, very high bid compared to what the available funding was and what the engineer's estimates for the project were. Those bids were, or that bid was rejected, and more or less we went back to the drawing board. We met with the federal and the state DOT. We went through our numbers. We went through the contractor's numbers. We met with the contractor. We met with the city staff, and we kind of put together what we thought were more reasonable bids, where, where did we think we were, and then after we had those numbers, then we tried to put together what do we need to do in order to get us within those numbers. So that's what I wanted to talk to you tonight about. So the agenda, look at the renderings and the plans of the original bid, and then look at them compared to what we think our new proposal should be. Uh, South Main, Central Main, North Main, Jefferson Street. Plan view of the riverfront, and then same type of thing. We, we, we did the same thing. Even though the riverfront didn't get bid, we took whatever numbers. A, a good example is we typically use about 5% for mobilization. The bidder used 15 to 17%. DOT said they think we should be using about 10%. So our new bid has 10%. So that meant we had to increase our riverfront by 5% also. So the riverfront we had to make changes to. Then we looked at all of these construction changes. What are the cost implications? And then what does that do to our schedule? And then how are we going to try to get this to be more biddable so we have more bidders that can both um, give us a little more competition, which we think is a big deal. So I guess before I go too much further, the, the key philosophy we had was what is the most important part of the project? So try to focus on the more important parts of the project and cut in the places that maybe aren't as important. Jefferson Street was considered very important try to focus and do as much as we could on Jefferson Street. Main Street, very important, especially maybe not south of the railroad tracks, maybe not between High and um, um, Court Street, but in the middle, so what we call Main Street Central. For the riverfront, kind of between the port building and the in the auditorium, we thought were the most important areas. And then what is in that grant application that more or less has to be done? We have to do that in order to get the, the grant money. So that's, that's where we started at. So none of these are pleasant changes. We're not happy to have to do this, but it's kind of life to make this thing work. So this one is very similar to what I'm going to show you on a lot. This is Jefferson Street, what we considered the most important uh, area. So we're not reducing any areas. So the plan changes. No Wi-Fi and music. And the reason for that became to do Wi-Fi and music, you have to do a certain types of poles. Those poles became expensive. And it, it was just an area that would, could be cut. Remove pots. The pots became expensive. And the thought was those could be done at a later date at some other time. It doesn't change the design to have the pots. You can see here on the pavers, on the left side here, 
you can see we had eight foot of pavers in the middle. Well, we found out from, this, from the contractor that that's a real problem for him because he has to then, he can't do any of his concrete with a paver over here, and he gave us just really expensive numbers because it was a constructability issue for him. So on the new one, we made them smaller, and we put them up against the curb. So not only does that give you a savings of less pavers, but it also gives you a savings on the concrete cost of the road. So that was a that was a change. Some of the changes, um, the iron grates were like three hundred and some odd thousand dollars. So like Davenport, Moline, and others have grates. Instead of grates, they just have a mulch in there. So we went that direction. That's what this new bid would look like. And so that's primarily where we're at on that particular one. Now we'll go to the next one. Next one is Central Maine. Again, what we thought of, we had a bunch of ideas on Central Maine. We thought about doing different types of lanes, trying to do less, less pavement, but it's kept because of how wide it is, because of things, we, we couldn't get away with a lot of things. So essentially all as we did was we removed pots, we reduced the amount of trees, we reduced and simplified, simplified, simplified the flow through planters. Again, we got a lot of discussions from contractors that the flow through planters, and you can see here they're raised up over here, and the design that we had on those needed to be simplified in order to make it an easier bid for them to construct. So we, re we, we kept, every block has, a, has them, there's five of them, but they're not the exact same and there's not as many of them. By reducing them, you're also reducing the trees. So those are the big changes on that one. South Main, probably the biggest changes are on South Main. South Main, south of the railroad tracks. We wanted to utilize existing lights. On the west side, this side, you can see we had a fairly large um, kind of a bioswale the whole way down with lots of plantings. And what we ended up doing is trying to keep a bike trail, a 10-foot bike trail, on the, on, the wet, on the east side. But then this west side, we left the same. So this is more or less like it is, will be existing, and we change the pattern of flow of the thing. Remove the bioswales and plantings, and change this surface from PCC to an HMA overlay. A lot of this, there's, there's sewer separation underneath it, which is not really part of the Tiger Grant, and we got a pretty good grant bid on the sewer separation. So leave that, there'll be concrete patching and then an overlay of asphalt. So it will look good, but it will not have exactly the same look we envisioned. It will still be, a, I think, a tremendous increase. Jefferson Street, to me, the naked eye will hardly know the difference. On South Main, you're going to get a tremendous improvement, but people would know a difference if they were paying attention to, to what we were doing. North Main, and this is just between High and Court. And as you can see on the left side, we had the bump outs and we had quite a bit more streetscaping in here. And what we did is we took all of that out, we did just ADA improvements, and we did some striping in order to get it to fit into the existing thing. So no streetscaping between high and court, HMA overlay only, about two inches of overlay, and then we will have to do the ADA ramps. All right, so that's, now we get down to Riverfront. Riverfront, like I said, we didn't bid that one, but we did go through and did a pretty exhaustive cost estimate revamp, including brought in some contractor folks, talked to people about what the prices should be, so any prices that we used on the streets, we're using the same type of pricing on the similar items, <laughs> which brought us up probably two or $300,000 from where we were, maybe even 500000 and we had to go cut. So these type of things, these parking lots were in there as 
these three parking lots were in there as alternates before. Not part of the base bid, but they were in there as alternates. We decided that because of the cost that these alternates are probably not going to make it in. They are designed, it's all done, but that we should leave them off altogether because, again, people complained that if you have too many alternates, especially last year, they said you were, it makes it look like even more of a difficult bid. So you're having trouble trying to get bidders. And one of our things we want to do is entice bidders. So they were saying, try to reduce your alternates. And that came from the federal DOT. So this was our plan here. Then we go to the next plan. So we take those alternates off. We still have all of the work we were going to do in here. This is west of the auditorium. And we talked about doing this as the only alternate. So right now, that has an overhang and all that. We were going to do the work that's shown in green, but that is alternate one. And that's the only alternate. You can see here, when we, if we don't do that, you lose some parking here and here. So we did add parking back here and here, which we had talked about in the past, to make sure that we tried to have essentially the same parking situation. So then you get to between the buildings, you're still going to get the same uh, spray, spray pad. You're going to get this large shade structure. But as you can see in the wings, they had a shade structure here and another one over here. We are down, down to one shade structure. And that, again, was a savings of about $150,000 to do that shade, to, to, to save there. But again, I, I believe that as you look down Wash or down Jefferson or Washington, you're going to see the riverfront. I still think you're going to get the exact same feel that we were going to get before. So we tried to pull funding out of the places that we thought were least, um, least important. This is one that was kind of painful for me personally because I know we put a ton of time into what this could look like behind the auditorium. But again, the cost got to where we just had to find something, and I'll show you later. So we more or less said we kind of leave that as it is now. So it's a green space area, and we kind of leave that. So what kind of cost savings, and I know this is a little bit hard to read, what kind of cost savings are we trying to get to? So what we did here on this slide is just show you that the previous bid came in at $21 million which we all believe was a crazy number. But still, you have to put it down. You have to look at it because that's the bid that actually came in. So what, what kind of money can you save and where? And this chart kind of tells you. So South Main, we're saving almost a million dollars, 820000 On North Main, we were saving $475,000. These are big numbers, but we had to come up with them. The speakers, which seemed kind of crazy, but when you add them all up with all those poles and you change the poles, you can get a fairly big savings out of that. We kind of came right down and we come down to a, a number of about $5.2 million of savings. That doesn't get you near where we need to be. So, so then we have another number here that's called, I'm sorry, that number was something different, $3 million. Then we had a number here called the contractor competition and clarifications. All the things we did that really are going to be hard to put exact numbers on, but to make it a lot easier. So when the company said, we want to be able to use our paver as much as possible, we don't like to be have to, have to do any handwork. So we're trying like heck to make it so they can use more of a paver situation, try to do things to make it simplified. Also, we know you've got to get three or four bidders to make that number, $5 million, a reality. I believe it is a reality. Um, and we can go a little further and talk about it a little more. Leo, what was the savings on not putting the speakers in and music? Yeah, it was like 300000 when you add it all together. OK, thanks. No, yeah, if you, add the, if you add the Wi-Fi, it's wi -Fi, four yeah. and a quarter. Yeah. Well, more than that, actually, 440. Okay, so next one. So 
what kind of savings were we looking to do at, River, at, at the Riverview Park? It's kind of the same thing. What lessons learned? We knew that the maximum allowable was $5 million. Our current plan comes in about $5 million 51. So we're right on where we thought we have to be, but that doesn't do the west side of the auditorium where the overhang is. I don't think that's the greatest of, I mean, I, I would love to be able to do it. We all would love to be able to do it. Jesse, the city engineer, says, hey, add, maybe we could put one alternate in, and that would be a good alternate, in case it, it fluctuates the other way. You get three or four bidders, and all of a sudden you get a good bidder. Now you'll have that ready to go. So that's why that's in there that way. These... Okay, this is the same chart we've seen before with how much money is available. So the money hasn't changed. The money stays the same, and we try to move forward. Schedule. Schedule's definitely going to change. And I know this is hard to see, so I blew it up on the next slide. What I kind of wanted you to see, if you, if you have this electronically, is this was our existing schedule, mm -hmm. and this down here blown up is kind of the new schedule. So I want to show you the new schedule. This is the previous one, and I wanted to focus in on this one. This is the proposed schedule. So this is kind of our rebid period where we're at right now. And then we know that in the time frame, we have to have plans by the beginning of February back to DOT in final form. The other thing we wanted to do is bid these both together not in the same contract, separate contracts, but then a bidder could bid on one, he could bid on two, and then if he wants, he could bid a third bid that says, if you give me one and two, I'll give you a deduct. The, the state calls that best value contracting when you have two of these, and they're going to allow us to do that best value contracting. But that just means we have to line these things up. And so that's what we've done. We have to have this to the DOT by February, I think it's 9th, and then that means a June 15th bidding. So between February 9th and June 15th, we've got a lot of work to do with contractors and make sure we get them up to speed and where we want them to be. So let's go one more. Oh, let's go back to this. Um, we basically tried not to change too much of the duration of how long this project, these projects should take. The X's are these winter periods that'll be X'd out, won't be part of the working days. We tried to do um, riverfront in one contract. So the riverfront before we were gonna do north and south. We've kind of cut it back enough that we think if we do it in one contract, we'll get even a better price. On the, the roads, we're doing one contract, but we do two phases. So the riverfront's gonna be one phase, and now the road's gonna be two phases the main street part of it and then we did have a little overlap and we'll have to write specs so that jefferson street only certain work and they're not they're not um interfering with each other and they're because there was some concern that they don't want to have everything tore up so we can still do that here leo uh, the parking lots that got cut out yes more importantly the the south one the yes. jetty work is still being done. It's just not the parking lot being done. Yes, let me go back to that because I missed that. Thank okay. you. That's very good. Very good. Yeah, I, I should have I should have so focused on the, that. The line share of what the south would look like will be done. And right. in the future, if the city decides they could go back in and redevelop that park. All the riverfront work river and riverine work, yep. for instance, this is the boat ramp that will be re reconfigured. This is the jetty. And they're going to put in all new riprap. And this is going to be a ramp, a boat. So, so when boats come in, they have a place to sit before they go in and out. That's one of the problems. So this is all being done. This roadway is all being done with the flood mitigation. So this part won't be any different. That can be done later, and this could be done later. Okay. The mooring facilities are still included also. The, this part up where the north boat ramp is, we really never plan to do much up here. So I think Nick has some potential funding for north of here with FEMA. Just that here area, though. 
just the pier area with rock. So that, that part will get done. All right, so let's go back to, so that's a good point, though. All that riverine work, including the, the boat ramp, we could not have taken that boat ramp out. We had to do that work. So here's, here's some of the things we're looking at. We've got a list of 20 targeted contractors. I've already talked to probably about six of them. Um, we're going to be using the IDOT best value contracting. I would like to prepare a project information sheet, and it's something VNK does on our own jobs a lot of times, and send it out. I've already talked to the DOT about that. They're nervous about it because what they don't like is anything that you would do that might show that you're trying to, um, trying to give anybody any advantage. But if we can send it to a plan room where everybody could get it, I think, and I talked to Kent Ellis, the, city, the, the state, and he thought that was a good idea. So I think we're going to get away, get, get, be able to do that. Because when I talk to these contractors, they basically want stuff. They either want plans, which I can't send them plans right now, or they at least want like a fact sheet that tells them what's, what it is, where it is, and, and all of that. So that's another one. Um, we know that the, uh, we also plan to do, and this is one that is more a strategic move than anything else. We plan to bid alternate on Jefferson Street and in the Central Main, a HMA full depth alternate instead of, so instead of eight inches of concrete with a six inch base, you do 10 inches of asphalt with an eight inch base. A lot of times anymore, that price difference isn't a lot different. Like in the Quad Cities on a lot of ours, I've bid them. Sometimes the HMA comes in cheaper that way. Sometimes the, the, the concrete. A lot of cities, majority of cities, your city would prefer concrete. I think I would prefer concrete. But I think having an alternate bid helps keep everybody on the straight and arrow and we can make those decisions later if that comes in that way. That way, every, the concrete people know, if I don't give them a good bid, they might go HMA. So I think it is a wise move on this one to try because our concrete bids were, were high. I'm not saying it was a contractor's fault. I'm just saying the way it was. So we've got a number of moves that we're doing to try to drive those prices in the right direction. I told you about the planters. Um, approved, We've, we have added vendors. We weren't happy with some of our lighting and site furniture prices, even though they're small dollars compared to the big dollars we need, they still were high. Nick and others pointed that out, that hey, why are they so high? I think it was just a bad bid, but we did take time to go in and add vendors to see if we can get more vendors to do the same thing. Try to tell vendors that if you don't give us your best price, there's gonna be other vendors coming in and beating you out on them. And we, re we talked about Jefferson Street. So that's in a nutshell of where we're at on there. This is not the greatest news in the world. I think you are gonna have, and I, I do mean this, you're gonna have a fabulous project. If we can get this thing bid and built, I think you'll be surprised at how good it looks and how, how on Jefferson Street, like I said, I don't think a single soul is going to hardly know. They might not hear music, and they might have wanted to hear music, and maybe that can be put in later or something like that. But that's – any questions? All right, what, was the, what was the line on them on the outdoor amphitheater? That was about – it wasn't a lot of work because we were we – had, we had skinnied it down anywhere. I want to say about 300 and – a little over 300,000. So if this, if this comes back – Way under budget. Is that something we can plug back in? Absolutely. Okay. And, and that's what I was going to tell you. Every single thing is designed. Okay. So if there's things we wanted to add back in, we can snap and add things but back in. But we don't in. have to go back through DOT approval to mm. throw you, you would have to do a change order through the DOT. Mm -hmm. they, would, um, they would be very, um, as long as it's within the scope of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Since we're in that area, I think we'd be fine. If, okay. if all of a sudden Nick said, hey, I want you to go upstream north of the bridge and do something there. Now it's outside the scope and they're not going to let you. But if it's right in the scope like that is, they're going to let you do it. Right. Okay. Leo, I'm trying to remember what the previous pictures looked like. 
And I remember with the grates and things, aesthetically, it seemed a little bit more pleasing to the eye. It did. I'm a little you, distraught when you said we won't notice any difference. If you look, I'll, I'll go back to that picture real quick. And you're right, on that particular part, let's go look at that. So this picture right here, it, it's hard to see, but you can see we tried to show it a little bit. If, if you go over here, this is iron grates. Yeah. And then on this side, you can see how they just showed it. That's mulch. But I can tell you, um, there's a lot of really nice streetscaping in Davenport and in Moline. And it's both exactly like it is on the right. And I don't go down there and say, oh, that looks horrible or anything like that. Okay. Do I think grates look better? Yes. Yeah, I do don't, too. don't get me wrong. I'm not going to argue with you. Believe I, I me. I think grates well. look better. Yeah. But maybe we'll come in under bid, and that's something we can add back in. And grates, so. are, grates were a, a lot of $300,000 item. Mm -hmm. When you start thinking about it, that's a lot of money for it grates. It is a lot of money. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. I just also wonder how much uh, work we are putting on parks to have to fill that, keep it full every year. Every time yeah. it rains and those areas flood, all that mulch is going to float to the top, and it's going to float out onto the sidewalk. So what kind of, yeah. what kind of issues? We're we trying to make sure that doesn't happen. Make it so it's designed so it doesn't go over. Not saying it couldn't ever, but but it, it is more maintenance. I just I just see yeah. more conflicts. But for three hundred thousand dollars, grates, great grates. You have to clean off. There's 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 maintenance. Yeah. But I do think that especially Jefferson Street. I think you're gonna you're gonna be very proud when you see it done. Okay, good. I, mean, I trust you. Thank you. All right. Thank okay, you. Okay. Any other questions? Bill, Robert, you got any questions? All right, thank you, Leo. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, so. All right, and we're going to skip uh, okay. deep. We're going to skip DPI up next, so she can get out of here. Uh, DPI, DPI annual report. Amy Moyner, please. Sorry, Nick. I was just going to school board by six. Oh, you are. Oh, go ahead. I've got good time. Depends on where you stand with the issue. It may not matter in the end anyway. Okay. I'm Go sorry. ahead. Go ahead, Nick. I didn't know that. I just figured, you know, because you... I'll have this in PowerPoint. I'm okay. sorry. I didn't know that we were going to... Okay. I'm going to try and double stack my Thanks, Nick. Okay. That's the way it ended up. Welcome to sorry. downtown, Amy. That's it's the way okay. it goes. Anyway, uh, so this is this conversation is related to the Harrison Avenue project. Mm. Uh, just as a reminder, what we're trying to do there. Um, ultimately, it's about the James Madison property that the school district owns mm -hmm. and acquiring the property. Um, I had we had started the conversation early on uh, with the school district about acquiring property to do this exact thing. We didn't know the size of the pond at the moment. Mm -hmm. We do now. Uh, the, the, the image that I handed you and the one that's on the overhead is what the sized pond um, will need to be to be able to handle the storm sewer that we're adding on Harrison Avenue along with what I had initiated the conversation with the school district was that there could be some sort of forgiveness on stormwater fees that the school district pays for that property. And I'll go over that in a second. But then also uh, they had talked about it being uh, available for some future development and then a lot you know essentially sizing the pond to be able to handle that future development loading and so the pond has been sized with that in mind mm -hmm. um, it would be about 4.6 acres uh, that we would acquire mm -hmm. from the school district um, I have sent off a proposal after mm -hmm. discussing with Jim uh, about a 10-year waiver of their stormwater utility fees on the James Madison property and currently they pay $110 a month, so it'd be about 1,200, give or take, a year. That ERU rate goes up by 3% a year, um, and I sent a calculation off to them. Over the decade, it would be about a $17,000 waiver of stormwater utility fees, um, where I think the real benefit is, and I've explained this to the school district, is the future development costs of tying into the retention pond um, with it being sized appropriately, future developer went in and when the school district were to demo the property and sell it to a developer, uh, they could build the road infrastructure and then tie the storm sewer network into the pond and not be required to build their own pond. Um, per code now, uh, they would have to be, they would have to install a pond. Typically that involves 
uh, setting an out lot of a certain size to be able to handle the storm volume of that development. Um, the, the cost of do, doing a pond like this could be, we don't know the exact size of what that specific pond is taken out of what we already have, but it'd be about 50 to 75K to build a pond like that. And then you lose a percentage of your acres that you're trying to sell. Uh, so the real, the real value for the school district is on the back end if and when they sell it. So the full absorbed cost or value to them is in 10 years after the 10 years a waiver and then the sale of the property to a developer. Um, essentially being able to ask for more money from the developer because you have those facilities already uh, set up for that purpose. Um, call I just actually had with uh, Mr. Cohen and Mr. Reynolds was that this proposal is too low, um, that we're too far apart on where that stands. Um, I, this doesn't matter anymore anyway. Um, I had a couple parcels that was city owned that I thought maybe we could swap, but they're not interested in those. So um, I talked to Mr. Cohen about, you know, what, what would it take? I don't know what, what they want for the property. Normal protocols that the city would go through for a property that we're trying to acquire is we'd one, engage with the property owner, which we've done, but two, we would hire a, an appraiser to appraise the, the value of the property and then we would make a market rate type offer mm -hmm. to, the, to the property owner and then we would acquire it. And if they um, didn't want to, we could go through the condemnation and a domain route, but this isn't the normal route that we were going through, so we never hired an appraiser to find what the value of that property is. I think the, the disconnect, I'm speaking for the school district, is that they thought the pond would be a little bit smaller in size and wouldn't go as far to the west. And so if we were to make a cash offer, um, I don't know that I would have the, the detention pond access available for the developer. You could essentially shrink the pond size. I don't know by what degree. Um, so you could essentially reduce the amount that you're going to acquire from the school district. Um, can it go further to the east or topographically? It's topographically locked to where it was. And I, and cause I pushed that multiple times with our design engineers to say as far to the north and east as you can get that because it impedes on some of the flatter ground on the west side of the property. And I think that's where they're seeing the impact is that they've been told by a developer that the wooded area would make a nice lot for somebody to purchase a home and have the trees in the backyard. And I, I don't disagree. I quite, I guess the question, for us is to understand what the value of that area is. In my opinion, I don't think as it sits that that land is, is worth a, a great sum of money, but I couldn't really honestly tell you what that is worth until I have an appraisal done, but I don't know if- So is that what you're asking for is approval for appraisal? Well, appraisal is only gonna be a few hundred bucks. I don't know where the council feels comfortable for me to be able to continue to make offers with uh, the school district moving forward because we have a, a little bit of a disconnect on where we're one at. Question on, I, one, one question I would have is, is there an alternative to what we need to do with the stormwater on Harrison that doesn't involve us putting a pond in here? Moving f as it's designed now, we have to. We predicated okay. the design of this project based on early conversations that it wasn't going to be an issue, okay. so we moved forward. Looking back, I wish we would have had that locked up before we went this far, but it's hard to acquire property when you don't know the design footprint and then push stuff forward. So it was just tentative conversations, um, but in theory, you could cut the, the sewer separation out of the project and still do the road project. I think it's a disservice it make to the project to since we've gone so far to try and do this, but I, I don't know where the the, media, the middle ground or where the school district would want to end up. In, in previous conversation, they said that they would be okay with doing we, some sort some, of, some sort of. Yeah, we, we had met with in Eric's office with um, super with the superintendent, and everything seemed agreeable with what we were talking about. And that was close to a year ago, and then this last week or two is when we've been told after a year's design work that we're nowhere near what needs to be offered. And it's really put us into a quandary because, uh, I mean, we had gone off of what the school had told us was, was a path that could, was reasonably able to move forward. 
Uh, you don't have another spot for a water detention spot that can go here. I mean, the only other alternative is to keep it within the old uh, pattern of going through the storm sewers at this point. Okay. I mean, in theory, you could, you could do some of the work for storm sewer separation by taking the pipe and, and ending it just north of where Harrison Street would go. The reason why we took it south is because we have the availability to take it through here and kind of slow it down before we send it down the ravine. But the, the current flow moves north through like Bonds Hollow. We could do the, a part of a project where we take the storm sewer and put new infrastructure, but we stub it back into the combined and come back later and separate from there until the river. We've also written some pretty significant checks for easements in some of these properties uh, to be able to run this. Avenue. For the one just north, of, we we paid a for fairly decent sum Several of money for that dollars, property. Didn't we? Correct. Yeah. So I mean, well, why don't, why don't we get an appraisal on it and see if we're see if they're closed? And I don't. The struggle that I have is I don't know where close is. Well, so and I'm not extremely familiar with the eminent domain process, but my guess would be is if you had to go down that path, we would be paying somewhat of a market value for it anyways, right? Yep. So that's a number that we need to know regardless of whatever course of action we're going to take. It probably makes sense to pay the few hundred dollars it would take to get that appraised just so we have that yep. number. The, the timing is probably the most frustrating part on my end because I have a, we have a tree clearing proposal out on there, and it's tough to have a tree because we have to take the trees down for this area prior to April 1 you're we're compressing our time frame for contractors to be able to do that essentially if we're not able to do that prior to April 1 this project probably gets kicked back a year at a minimum because we have to wait till the next fall till the end of Indi the bats get out of here that's oh, the, the bats. Missouri bats yeah. Indiana, Indiana bats Indiana, Indiana. I don't know why they like Iowa but they're here I forgot about them <laughs> well um so you're going to the school board tonight? That was my plan. Okay. okay. Now, is there any other guidance that I should get an appraisal done? Is there? I would see if they would be a, agreeable it, to have an appraisal done and see, establish that as fair value. Yeah. And I just wanted to clarify, their main objection is for a future sale, the person that wants to build on the land might not have a wooded lot. I don't want to read too much into that, but that okay. was my read on it, yeah. is, is that we are acquiring some of the area that would have probably been sold as part of a lot for, for a residential home. Okay. You know, it would have been the back, the eastern portion of the lot. Just tell okay. them, just tell them that, uh, that Rachel may come through again and they don't want all yeah. those trees. I think the, for me, the, the part is in good faith, after a good faith conversation a year ago, we took steps in order to do what we were going to do based on that conversation. It's it's too late in the game to change the rules, I think. And if they think the value is not enough, well, let's go get an appraisal and see what this see what see what they say. Are are we willing to make a cash offer and waive the stormwater utility fees? I don't know that the the duration of a ten year stormwater utility and a substantial cash offer would make a lot of sense yeah. in my opinion. I think you, part of it's to negotiate, figure out what the value is, and then give them. If, if, the, if the value needs to adjust, I mean, the, kind of the, the cap that I would say is pretty close to that fair market value. Mm -hmm. We have to be careful not paying too much of a That's premium right. anyway. But if it's a, that can be an offset between stormwater fees and that cash yep. outright. But that discussion would come back to you all regardless. Right. So real quick, the ERU fee you're talking about is on this property, right? Yeah. Just adjacent, yeah. But this property is likely not going to be there in its current form three years from now. And that's the struggle that I think the school district has, is that they would only receive a three-year waiver of the utility fees and essentially receiving thirty-five dollars to $4,000 for a property of this size. Right. Okay. So then you counteract it. Yeah, for a little more cash and less... The other thing that is on later on the agenda is we both have Lynch Dallas as a as legal representation. So we'd have to hire and an attorney. Have, well, we have to we have to just sign a waiver. Okay. That we okay. want them to at least handle the legal proceedings. Now, if that were to go in a different direction based on a conversation that I'll have here shortly, I mean, I would relay that back to you. That yeah, we just let us know. Okay. Is that enough for you before you walk away? This is this is the easy conversation because you have context. I think yeah. the tough part is to walk into a room where the context right. is, is is coming from the superintendent and the business director, and it's understood. But I don't. There's a whole 
ramification of the project project necessarily is okay so I don't know how to play negotiator between two public entities is the, is the Good tough luck. part. Let us know if you need help on it. All right, uh, moving on now, DPI annual report. Okay. Thank you for your patience, Sorry. Amy. I should be the easy part here. <laughs> so thank you, Council. Um, I'm Amy Moyner. I'm the Executive Director with Downtown Partners. Welcome. Thank you. Um, I'm going to do an overview of Downtown Partners and give you a little bit of insight to 2021, but overview of what we did in 2020 as well. So just to let you know what Downtown Partners is, we are a Main Street program. Um, so Main Street program was launched in 1970s by the National Trust for Historic Preservation to revitalize our downtowns. So what we saw in the 70s was uh, people moving into malls. And so with that, we saw the downtowns dying. So the His National Trust for Historic Preservation put into place in Main Street program. Burlington became part of that program in 1986. So we've been going for 35 years and we have a really great track record. And the reason why we have that track record is because um, we are accredited um, Main Street program and so we have monthly reports. So we get to see then uh, the growth of our businesses, um, our volunteer hours, any of the development that's happened in downtown. So uh, it's really great to be part of that Main Street program. And um, we just went through accreditation to this last year and it's a yearly accreditation and so we looked at our volunteer hours um, we looked at um, if we have a healthy program so uh, John and Jim are both part of that program um, on the board of directors so thank you for all of your service with that with Main Street to be an accredited Main Street program we have to follow the Main Street approach um, so this just gives a little bit of overview of what our four points are. So we've got organization, our promotion, our economic vitality, and then our design. And you'll see that through our committees and our board that represent each of these points. Um, so with the organization, that is our board. They are focused on providing a healthy program, uh, fundraising, our volunteerism, uh, community involvement, and then also just being a resource for our downtown district. Economic Vitality, they are a catalyst for investment um, in our downtown. They ensure that we have a diverse economic base. Uh, they recruit the entrepreneurs and then they support all the downtown properties as well. Our design committee, so when you think about design, our committee um, helps out with that. And we'll talk a little bit about Tiger Project and how that design committee might be changing in the future here. Uh, but they are the physical and visual assets of downtown. So when you look at downtown, that's what you're seeing with the design committee. And they create those inviting atmospheres for our community to come down, stroll, linger, and want to stay downtown. And then our promotions uh, piece. So the promotion point is through our committee. Um, that's the kind of fun that you see downtown. So those events that we have, um, they support the shop, eat, and drink local programs. So all about shopping local. And um, they also just initiate that consumer traffic to downtown. So when we talk about downtown, what's downtown? Um, we represent 42 blocks. We've got 126 buildings. We've got historic districts. Um, we have got a lot of employers, 196 employers, and give or take a few there. Um, and then 1,100 full-time and 400 part-time employees, again, give or take there. And then uh, we have 160 rental apartments and growing. Um, so you'll see that with the future projects uh, with downtown. Of course, we've got our courthouse, our city hall here, the police department, the fire department. Um, we've got our you know, libraries, museum, art centers. Um, we've got parks. We've got uh, the Welcome Center. We've got the riverfront that's going to be an amazing uh, welcome to our visitors. Our church buildings, banks, and of course, the most unique feature that we've got is Snake Alley. Yeah. <laughs> So downtown partners, what are we? So uh, I started in September of 2020, so I've been here only a few months, four months. Um, and one of the things is um, I get confused with this chamber. So downtown partners is not the chamber. We are part and we are a division of the Greater Burlington Partnership. We are a 501c6 nonprofit organization. We've got our board, we've got our bylaws, and um, we've got our budget and uh, our committees as well. And then we are an accredited Main Street program, like I talked about before. Downtown Partners is not a charitable program. Uh, we are not a membership program organization. We are not part of the city government, but we support the city government. And uh, we are not funded by the state or a national trust. But how are we funded? 
I'm sure you've all seen this map several times. We are 30% um, of our funding comes from our SMID tax. So this, that's a self-supported municipal improvement district tax. Um, that is um, for every three, I'm sorry, it's $3 for every $1,000 in valuation on our commercial properties. And this was put in place in 1996. So if any of you are around for that, thank you. Um, that's where a lot of our funding, like I said, 30% of our funding for the program comes from. We also get funding through the city of Burlington. We get funding through Partnering for the Future, our beautification grants. And then we have our fundraiser, 144 envelopes that you're probably familiar with as well. And then we have sponsorships and promotional marketing programs as well that help with our radio and with some of our social media programs that um, the retailers and our uh, small businesses help put in money for. I did put up our mission and vision statement here because in December, so last board meeting, we did approve and adopt a new mission and vision. And part of that was because we are seeing lots of residential growth in downtown. Um, we are also with a streetscape project, um, you know, that's going to be off in the next year, I guess. It's going to start here. Um, but we are, are really focusing on um, how do we drive um, just the community to downtown. So our mission statement uh, is this. Downtown Partners Incorporated is a volunteer-driven Main Street program established to preserve and revitalize downtown Burlington while improving the quality of life for the community. So everything we do, we um, are going to hold that mission uh, in our hearts to make sure that we are delivering that for the community. The vision for downtown uh, Burlington is to be a unique and vital downtown that celebrates history, encourages entrepreneurial spirit, artistic expression, entertainment activity, hospitality to our visitors, and instills a sense of place in our community. Again, when we talked about our residentials um, and all of these new spaces that are being created with the, the Tiger Project, this is what really, um, you know, what we really want to deliver on. So how our mission and vision is going to be the driving force behind what we do. So um, what we do is we focus on business recruitment. Um, we focus on bringing entrepreneurs downtown. Um, we are focusing on events and different facade loans. Uh, we are the bypass or the pass through for um, uh, grants through Main Street, Iowa. And so this is just a, a small list of what we do. Uh, but when you think about the things downtown to the decor um, and uh, also being just a communication piece with the city as different projects take place. So who does that and, and what do we do? So um, like I said, we are a four, we follow the four point approach with Main Street program. One being the organization, that is the board of directors. The second being the economic vitality committee. Um, so with that, we are creating welcome kits right now for our residents um, and for our businesses to showcase everything that we have in downtown. We focus on business retention and attraction and growth. We focus on the upper story development, um, space inventory and building in inventory for those entrepreneurs. The tours of any available spaces. So this last um, month we did a tour of the Bilal Lofts just to show some of those new spaces and commercial spaces. Um, block captain programs, and then just being the communication channel for projects. So any of the projects that are happening uh, with Tama, with Merge, um, with Churchill, and with the Streetscape, that's what we're going to focus on um, using this committee to be that communication piece. Our promotions committee, so like I said, that's kind of the fun downtown, that's the events. Um, if they had it their way, they would have events every day. Um, so they've got lots of great ideas. But what they're focused on and some of the big events are, you know, farmer's market or shop, wine, and dine that we did this holiday season, uh, spring and holiday open houses. Um, you see there we did the autumn welcome uh, as well. And then like our open house when we reopened um, after the closure. Social media engagements, holiday celebrations, living windows, um, and the parade, which we weren't able to do this year but have on plan for next year. And then, or I should say 21 here and then retail events, and then are also just promoting the commercial activity and traffic of downtown. When we look at our design committee, that's the visual assets that you see in our downtown. So like Leo said, if the Tiger Project <laughs> takes away planners, um, you know, that's our flowers that we, we do, uh, the Earth Day cleanup. Uh, we take care of the county seat benches, the holiday decor, um, any of those public art, and, um, and then also the historic preservation and uh, facade loans that we do. 
So 2020 was not what we thought it was going to be for downtown partners. Uh, we shifted away from driving traffic and consumer activity to downtown to supporting our small businesses. Um, and so some of those ways that we supported, you see the welcome back when uh, downtown finally opened and we did the open house. But we also had um, just support for our small businesses. Some of that support was through the Iowa um, Small Business Development Center had a mobile lab. So we brought them in and they were able to take part, or small business owners were able to take part in the program. They were able to learn from experts about e-commerce and had the opportunity to get on shopiowa.com um, to be able to promote themselves and then also sell products. Um, virtual Small Business Lab. So we hosted a small business lab um, and that was just to support our entrepreneurs and our small business owners through um, helping them with online presence and then coaching and peer-to-peer -peer roundtables as well. We, as the partnership and downtown partners, uh, came out with a retail recovery toolkit to help with the opening of the businesses um, after the closure and then also uh, with selling online as well. Again, it's ways to help promote themselves, which a lot of our, our businesses were not, did not have an online presence. And then I am downtown video series. Um, so while uh, the businesses were shut down, downtown partners helped with the I am downtown video series uh, that showcased products, services, and insight on how the business became to be. And then we had an anonymous uh, local essential worker donate money to uh, simulate um, just consumerism in downtown. And so that money was given through gift cards and a giveaway to our community. So we helped support that. We had some wins in 2020. Uh, one of the wins was the Main Street Challenge Grant. So uh, Deluxe Aesthetics was the winner of the Main Street Challenge Grant and received $75,000 um, through Main Street, Iowa. So they are doing the rehab of 506 Jefferson, and that includes facade restoration and upper story renovations. So if you haven't driven down Jefferson, check that out. And now, 2020 is hopefully behind us, but we know that there's a lot of support that we have to do for our small businesses. Um, so looking ahead at 2021, when I say there's 42 planned events, that seems like a lot, but I can tell you in previous years, there have been 54 to 60 events. So we're not able to host as many events as we would like to in 2021 due to the pandemic still lingering. But we are excited and we're going to hit those events strong and you're going to see a lot of that starting with um, in March and all through the rest of the fall. Again, we want to try to go back to normality, and we're going to try our best to do that with some new additions, <laughs> I should say. Um, we are still going after uh, um, attraction and growth for new entrepreneurs in our empty, underutilized spaces. We still continue to do beautification through facade preservations, design assistance, and public art, and uh, focusing on upper story development. We will be the communication piece uh, through the to the business owners and small business owners um, and building owners for Churchill, Tama, and Merge projects, and we'll talk about the Tiger project as well. And then, um, but our focus right now is really that how do we get consumerism back into our small businesses in downtown? So you will see social media campaigns to increase awareness and spark economic stimulus in downtown in our dining, um, shopping, and in our uh, entertainment district. So one of the things, if you've seen this fall, if you follow us on Facebook, is that eat, drink, and shop local. We're hitting that campaign hard. Um, but we are also focusing on, if you follow us, um, look this into this week at our new campaign called put it on downtown's tab so you will I'll just kind of let that linger there follow us on Facebook and you'll see that new program um, Tiger Grant project so like Leo said um, you know we don't know we're hoping uh, Main Street will start into 21 now Jefferson in 22 with completion in 23 um, but whatever happens, we are going to be the communication conduit. Um, so we'll make sure that the business owners and the building owners understand what's going on, when it's going on, and help facilitate that. Our promotions committee is already thinking about ways uh, to drive consumerism down there during the destruction and, I should say destruction, disruption of the construction in downtown. <laughs> um, so we are focusing on that and how we can still create that traffic downtown. The exciting thing is, I don't know why my pictures went this way, but um, 
We completed 300 Washington last month. Woohoo! <laughs> so an RFP was sent out in January. Um, you are seeing there is a dumpster outside, and we do have a team in there doing some cleanup, and there will be some volunteer efforts just to make that building more marketable. But RFP was sent out, and our goal, it's posted in my office, I look at it every single day, is um, our goal is to aggressively market 300 Washington building for that redevelopment. So we are excited. This building has so much potential, and we are just excited to see what it's going to be for our downtown. So how can you support downtown if you don't want to buy a building or start a small business? Um, eat, drink, and shop downtown. That's what our, our small businesses need us. Um, they have been struggling and are going to continue to struggle until um, they can be fully opened and people's buying habits kind of change. Um, so we need to eat, drink, and shop local, spend our time downtown, um, linger, stroll downtown, see what we have to offer. Um, attend our events. If you don't feel like um, you can sponsor events, there's other ways you can sponsor with your time. So volunteer. And then also just follow us. Follow us on Facebook. We have um, almost 11,000 followers. And Instagram, we over, have over 1,000 followers. Um, so follow us on downtown Burlington, Iowa. And tag us anytime you're downtown. If you take a picture, let us know you're there. And then also let us know what's happening. Keep us in communication. If you have entrepreneurs that are looking to start a business downtown, if you know of a building, if you're selling a building, um, anything like that, uh, let us know what's happening so we can continue to grow our downtown. And then thank you. Thank you for your support with downtown. Appreciate it. Does anybody have any questions for Amy? The sub Hang on, Robert. You'll ne you'll be next. Go Sorry. Ahead, the seventy-five thousand dollars at Meester Child is that something that's awarded to our community annually? It is. Um, so there's fifty-five communities in the Main Street program, and we have to go through a whole competition. So we do a, a local competition first to see who is going to win that to go on to the Main Street program, and then the Main Street program um, is able. They they do the awards. They um, so this year I think there was thirty communities out of the fifty-five that went for the Main Street program. Um, there was only $925,000 that could be awarded, and so we were one of the 13 communities that were um, that achieved that award. And you had, what, four applicants, I think? Four applicants it was before me, but I think there was three or four, yeah. yeah there, I think there were three or four. Yeah, so we'll be doing, um, so it is an annual award. It just depends on how much money IEDA has, um, and so it goes through that through Main Street. So we will be taking applications, um, I think, in the next couple months. So if, for the community, if anyone has any uh, renovations for downtown, we'll be taking those. Okay, Robert, go ahead. Hey, Amy, this is Councilman Kreitzer. Uh, someone on Facebook had the suggestion that they might add a sign along with the project, for example, the Tama building. If they just put a sign up that said the future home of whatever or what it is they're working on and just kind of kind of have like a poster on a, on a, you know, on a sign kind of thing. Um, so when those projects are going on downtown, like you guys are trying to sell uh, the old TIE Fighter shop, that there's something there for people to visually see what it is that's going on there and, and who the developer is and, and what the future plans are to kind of get people excited about what's going on. Yes, absolutely. Um, I know I saw lots of talk and chatter on uh, the Burlington Neighborhoods site about Tama. So yes, um, that is something our design committee is working on too during the, the construction of Tiger Project. But absolutely, that is something that uh, I'll actually bring that up in a board meeting and also committee meeting uh, this next month. Absolutely, that's something we could do. Wow. Thank and, you so much. Any other questions? Great job. I All will right. tell you that when I get my Google Maps at the end of the month, I'm a downtown guy. <laughs> we appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, All right. Now, moving on to appointments. Uh, we have four, it looks like. First one up, City Planning Commission. Uh, commission member Chris Reed passed away. He was a former councilman, too. That was a sad day. Uh, Bob Fleming has expressed interest in serving on this committee. It's requested council review. His application and consider appointing him to a three-year term, which would expire in April of 2024. Uh, Economic Devi Development Advisory Board Commission member Dennis Fitzgibbon term, term expired in July of 2020. Dale Allison, a uh, former editor of the paper, has expressed an interest in serving this committee. It's requested we review his application, consider appointing him to a three-year term, which would expire July of 2024. 
Human Rights Commission uh, and Dusselhorst term expired February 2020. Courtney Musselman Carter has expressed an interest in serving. Uh, please review her app and consider a three-year term to expire in Jan January 2024. And Commission Member Candy Hillier resigned on Decem in December 2020. Sam Helberg, uh, sorry, Samantha Helberg, I, I call her Sam, has expressed an interest in serving on this committee is requested the council review her application and consider appointing her to send to uh, a three-year term which ex expires in 2024 and then southeast iowa regional planning uh matt is serving for the city i'm the alternate we're requesting asking matt to uh, fill out one more year uh his term will expire in january 2022 and then reappoint me to the alternate when matt can't be there any questions on the appointments Sounds good. Okay, so you can go, Amy. You've, you've done your time here tonight. <laughs> I, I heard Sam's name, so yeah. I'm going okay. to so. All right. Uh, then, uh, now we're on the F fiscal year 2021-2022 budget overview, and then we'll proceed with the CIP five-year plan. Buckle up, kids. We've got a ways to go. You'll have to decide how long do you want to go tonight. That's up to you. That's up to council. Well, do you want, I mean, we haven't done this no. Do you want to get this knocked out because we have to do this? Well, um, yeah. Do you want to you want to do the five year CIP separate tomorrow night we after? Do that tomorrow. Let's do that. So let's do the budget overview. Then we'll do council work and we'll do five year CIP tomorrow after the other two. Okay. Okay. That way we can get out of here. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you. You want it done in what five minutes five or less yeah what, what, what we are, believe we in you okay Jim. so we're gonna move okay so we have our oh. <laughs> till tomorrow we're gonna do this real quick which is the overview and then we'll do this tomorrow and then we'll do the rest of the work so it won't take us long to do that okay okay so robert doesn't have the booklet but for you all you have your binders yep and it starts with the uh, information that stephanie has so nicely put in here for us uh, has a special meeting schedule, the budget calendar, and behind that is then the budget presentation overview, which I'll go over. If you want to put the do that as an overhead up there, Bill. The actually, that's what I kind of put it over there. On the, just, get just, to on there. Yep. Put it get on. To, uh, get to work, counseling. There you go. So we'll start with this front page, and I kind of wanted to just make sure that folks had a chance to see the areas that are highlighted as much as anything on here. Um, a lot of the wording that's in here for the five page, it's a five page overview, is very similar. I mean, the goals that I start here, timely communication of issues in a fair and open manner, try to balance needs of all community members, ensure we maintain compliance with requirements imposed on us, honor contracts and agreements, um, only have deficit balances on ongoing projects. Don't let balance, don't let deficits linger. Uh, maintain our 15% cash balance now that we've gotten to that. Uh, it's part of our financial management policies. Um, maintain our core services. Uh, make sure that we get adequate training um, for our employees and that we have equipment that's that adequately allows them to do their jobs in a reasonable manner. Uh, try to balance out the needs of new equipment. Uh, get it as soon as as soon as it makes sense economically, but not too soon. If that makes sense, try to balance out where is where is it that you get uh, ongoing maintenance costs or ability to use that makes it to where it's pr impractical to keep it. Um, when you get down into K, this is one area where I've changed the language a little bit here. Our goal has been to bring on new capital projects funded by debt service in a manner that allows debt issues to be paid for in a consistent manner, not backloaded, and ensure that annual usage of debt falls within a planned ladder of issues that keeps us from violating our usage of debt capacity, threatens our ability to issue future debt, or places our debt levy at too high of a property tax level. This budget is based on a debt service levy of 380. Um, we have had a long-term goal to see an average new debt issuance funded by property taxes be at the $2 million level funded by a $3 property tax asking. Now that was kind of done 
at a point where this wording has been there up through there pretty much mm -hmm. for the last six years. Uh, we increased this debt service levy from three dollars to three eighty back in two thousand thirteen and fourteen. Uh, that, that those two budget cycles. Uh, because we had some extremely backloaded debt with the goal of trying to get back down to that $3 level over time. However, this, the capital improvement plan, as it currently sits with what's out there on it right now, is not done in a way that allows us to get back there in the foreseeable future. Um, the size of the pro projects contemplated in this five-year plan, uh, they'll cause our goal to be delayed, largely due to the size of street and bridge projects contemplated on, the t on top of a demanding sewer, storm sewer project load. The five-year CIP capital improvement plan, as presented, has over $65 million of projects with $18 million funded purely by a geo debt levy. That's a little bit more than $2 million a year. Uh, all but $900,000 of the proposed borrowing amounts are for streets, bridges, and sewers, sewer, storm sewers. Um, that $65 million, the majority of that, $18 million of it sits in the streets and bridges. The majority of that is sewer work, um, flood, flood wall protection. Uh, it's, there's too much out there. And I don't have recommendations for what needs cut out at this point, but that's one that I'm talking with Travis in terms of uh, where do we need to get to on this as we move forward? Um, how much do we need to take out to keep us from getting too backloaded? You know, as we, I was talking with him earlier today, what's listed here is doable in five years, but it will put us back in the position five years from now where we were 10 years ago. Mm. Too much backloaded debt. So it, it's so, but I need to have some more discussions with him about how much needs to come out to be at a spot where you have a a survivable debt load that doesn't get us into long-term trouble. Um, so that's a little bit of a, a precursor on what we'll talk about with geo debt or our CIP tomorrow but also where we're gonna to have to have some discussions over the next few weeks as we talk about projects and where our priorities lie. All right, the review of changes since our last budget. The, cent the city, well, we have, we're in the process of getting the DESCOM agreement redone for next fiscal year. Um, part of this change is the elimination of the city paying for a portion of the DESCOM's costs. We've eliminated uh, the approximate $700,000 expenditure from our budget that's been in the police department's budget, it goes away, and also reduce the proposed property tax levy by 90 cents to reflect the decreased expenditure from the general fund. That's 700,000 that's in the, was in this year is roughly right at that 90 cent levy. So this is tr trying to reflect an idea of that's pure savings, not trying to spend it somewhere else. Um, and that was one of the concerns raised by the supervisors right. was that we would do that. Um, well, and we committed us council members to do that in those meetings. Right. So Abs absolutely. Absent some other thing coming up that was be unforeseen, that was beyond our control, and we have right. the ability to maintain and honor that. I mean, there, yeah. there isn't. So it's presented that way. Uh, local option sales tax has significantly increased with uh, our lost local option sales tax revenues 7% higher from FY20 actual to the budgeted amount in FY22. It's about 300,000 annually. It's helped us actually to, uh, in our CIP, we'll have several items that come out of the goal setting session, maybe not at the level that the council would like to see, but at least they're reflected in trying, trying to move forward with doing, doing those. Uh, hotel motel tax, though, has deteriorated. Yep, next page. Uh, with the bottom occurring late this last fall, uh, budget revenues for FY22 are 40,000 annually less than the actual number received in FY19. Uh, it's actually 
budgeted were 125,000 lower than what we were looking at last year at this time in the, in the current year's budget, which we will not come anywhere near hitting. Um, so not only though, our hotel motel tax is lower one of the primary things that we have funded out of there incre and in it's increased over time are support for the recplex and golf course uh, to just to be to keep up operations what we've had to provide out of hotel motel has increased significantly the recplex when i started was putting 30 to we were putting 35 40,000 annually into the recplex out of hotel motel tax for operations, uh, we're currently looking at 160,000 uh, in FY22, and just looking at projections for what's happening with our participation in the the uh, evening sports during the week, uh, the participation levels have gone down in several of those uh, events, and we see that annual required support increasing over the next you know as I look over a five-year basis trying to see what we can use out of these funding sources for capital improvement plan items uh, we see that this the required need to go into the recplex going from the 160 up to 180 and then eventually 100 or 210,000 in that five years out if if we continue to follow the pattern that we've seen over the last five years it ends up using up almost between that and then what goes into the golf course about sixty five thousand annually with it and then over the we got sixty five thousand going out of hotel motel in the fy twenty two proposed budget same figure looks to be pretty consistent for the out years um, and that's pretty consistent with what we had to do this last year uh, those are eating up just a, a ever increasing amount and it's kept a hotel motel from really doing too much for projects we have one major project in a five-year CIP plan that's funded out of hotel motel tax which is what uh, I don't remember the item uh, I mean it's is one of the rec recplex or uh, it's one of the recreations projects but I can't remember Ma basically it when we go back and look at the CIP and you look at Eric's list We'll, we'll, it identifies where we're, what we're funding uh, it with each item. For a lot of Eric's stuff with, the, with recreation, whether it's a project uh, like Lake Starker Renovations or something at the Recplex or something at the golf course, the capital items uh, are all done part, out of either local option sales tax or hotel motel tax and it's kind of like a mix and match to see where does the cash balance allow us to take from one or the other in a given year so and even as we've done that from one year to the next I'll change I've changed what our funding source is between the two just given the how much cash is available in each down in item E there flooding in 2019 you know, we are currently sitting with about an $800,000 deficit. We know we're going to get the majority of that reimbursed. We still look like we may be on the hook for about $200,000 of costs. It may be less, but it might. I don't think it's going to be more than that. Um, but when it comes to the end of the day and we have to balance out that account, account we're going to have to transfer over from general fund to, to make it whole. Um, we've agreed to cover 170,000 of the expenditures relating to the movement of the short line railroad. That balance is going to be covered out of the general fund this year. We had a cost run on the second phase of the flood wall. We borrowed 4.2 million for that project. Um, we're looking at 5.2 to 5.4 million of overall costs between the actual project engineering and having a little bit of contingency set aside. The first million uh, of that shortfall will look to cover out of local option sales tax. If there's anything more than that needed, we'll go to the general fund. Um, if it's that $5.4 million overall project, we may need another 200000 out of the general fund. Uh, the Tiger Grant, got to have a nice talk about that. 
Uh, it was sig significantly over budget uh, this last fall. Uh, going into this next year, even with the cost cuts that uh, were being proposed tonight and, look, and then the hope for savings from uh, increased bidding on it, uh, I mean, they're still looking, we're still doing, going into it with a million dollar contingency set aside to be covered out of road use tax. Um, it's a significant amount of excess funding to go to it, but it's also a significant project. Uh, if there's a desire to, to see something beyond that level uh, to accommodate some of the stuff that was in the original designs, you could look at that out of the general fund, but I think we've got a lot of other things that are coming out of the general fund right now. Item I, with the ABB closure, I know we had about a million, 1.5 million that we received from the state, uh, a RISE grant, or whatever the immediate economic opportunity thing that it is that that meets. What the, I don't know what the four letters stand for. Um, but that funding helped us to widen um, Agency Street and, and really make some nice improvements in that corridor on the west side of Roosevelt. Uh, with the closure, we're liable for up to 50% of that cost, uh, depending on what they had for meeting job requirements. Uh, we get to reduce that a little bit, potentially, but we're kind of tentatively sitting at just at guessing that uh, we're going to be on the hook for about 600000 Jim, in those grants, are they, are they partners in that grant? Uh, no. So there's no liability on there? Not on that, not on this. And this is similar. We did this with Case when we improved the uh, Highway 99 heading right. out there. Uh, they didn't meet their job threshold requirements, and we had to look at what the proportional amount of their job creation requirements were met, and then they did a, based off of that percentage, figured out what we owed back on that. Uh, but if it's about a $600,000 shortfall, that'll come out of road use tax as well. And we're sitting with a little over $2 million in road use tax, and we now, those two th last two Why items, that? take up $1.6 million of it. Yeah. Uh, which puts a little bit of crimp on our CIP, too, by the way. I've changed what we were able to fund out of road use tax and moved it over to having to be bonded instead of covering out a cash balance because of these two things. Um... And then we've also had some discussions recently here, the item, item J, the flood, flood improvement projects. Absent a solution for uh, what goes on with the change to online sales, uh, our funding stream of up to 26.2 million is in a lot of jeopardy. Now, the, I know Rob, I got an email back from our lobbyist um, he still encourages us to um, make a, any contacts we can with our legislate, legislators. Um, they're, he's, they're also working through um, Homeland Security. Uh, they are, the, they are over, have oversight of this funding stream. Uh, all of our reporting goes through them. They're trying to work through them for any fixes or relief that they can offer on this as well. Uh, but absent that, you know, we don't know where that funding stream is going in the future. What we've already been impacted by just because of COVID, we lost 350000 last year. We're on track to lose 800000 this year that we otherwise would have gotten. Uh, next year's budget has about 900000 that is proposed to have come in on that funding stream. Um, one of the, th I highlighted that last sentence there. Uh, off of the projects that we've already done, the debt payment this next year, uh, $220,000 on the first phase of the flood wall, uh, we'll have to come up with another funding source to make that payment, whether that's out of cash balance in a debt service fund or out of the general fund if we don't have a solution to, the, to this issue. Um, yeah. Make sure if, if you haven't contacted your legislators, please, legislators, please do. Yes, please. 
Um, new parking lot at Fifth and Valley. We that came in over budget. We had a we had a significant amount of funds set aside for it. We have some grant funding as well to go towards it, but we still may have. I, I haven't seen final costs on this yet, but I would anticipate maybe fifty thousand out of the general fund needing to cover that. Um, then with the parking lot, th third in Washington. Uh, as the former PD building and the adjacent structure are uh, demoed and a new building is built on, uh, the north side of that parking lot used the building as a wall. Uh, so there's going to have to be some adjustments made to that parking structure. It may not be as a significant sum, but you know, 15,000, 50,000, somewhere in that kind of neighborhood, uh, depending on what we do. Um, is also going to have to be covered as, as a shortfall. This year, we had the general fund had a, a lot of extra money. We were our, we were sitting in a spot where we were going to be a couple of hundred thousand to the good anyway. Uh, having five hundred and sixty thousand come in from the state through the CARES Act fund funding that they had received gives us the flexibility to cover the items that are in here, but we are getting a lot of demands on this list uh, for things that we've already committed to. Um, we had looked at, I had looked at the idea of the potential to do some alleys in a downtown area um, that could really use being redone. Uh, we identified four in particular, one right over here, uh, the other one uh, adjacent to the Tama and heading south to the tracks um, as being some candidates for for uh, alleys to get uh, redone. Uh, the one over by the Tama and heading south would have allowed uh, some coordination with Alliant to get their lines buried, and they were willing to work with us, and we had some conversations with them uh, this fall. However, the funding streams and the commitments that we're getting in the general fund, that's the only source that I can really identify as a good source for meeting that match. We're getting a lot of things that we could use that extra funding in the general fund for already. This, pro this is a project I think is a pretty, pretty high priority, yet when you put it into comparison with other things that we've already committed to, it makes it a little bit harder. But still something that I want you to see is we have out there identified that we'd like to see get accomplished, but we don't have a good funding source, so it's not in the CIP. All right, that gets us down to three. Review of overall, oh, I guess I skipped one, didn't I? Skipped the combined I skipped sewer. the combined oh, sewer. Gosh. You know, this is another thing where we had some We've had a lot of negotiations go on with the Iowa Department of Natural Resources where they've expressed a willingness to fundamentally relook at how we approach our CSO requirements, uh, moving more to an integrated management plan structure where we can take a look at our whole sewer system, stormwater system, and say we want to keep in mind the CSO work, but the, there's these other demands that need to be done too. They seem to be willing to allow us to move forward with more of a focus on some of the other items, whether it's a, uh, redoing a lift station, redoing the Mississippi River Interceptor, uh, some, some of these other projects that are very important to the overall sewer stormwater system, until we got lawyers involved. And that has really bogged us, bogged down uh, it's not like it was moving really fast anyway, but uh, we're not as optimistic about getting a solution that doesn't have us meeting the mandated requirements in our existing CSO order with some maybe some minor modifications as opposed to the major ones that we were looking for. We still have built into the, the five-year capital improvement plan the idea that we have agreement from the DNR to move forward with a complete revamp of, of how we approach this structure. Uh, 
We have a couple of lift stations that are on there, again, and the Mississippi River Interceptor, uh, Cascades, uh, Cascade, um, dang it. What am I thinking of? Not the equalization. equalization tank, thank you, is another project that's built out there uh, in the five years that uh, they may all end up having, being scrapped and go back to a different approach. I, I just, but we're moving forward and what will be presented is what we are hopeful that we can get them to do. What's the, what's the, we haven't had an update on that in a while, maybe you want to do it at a different time, but what's, what's the problem now? It sounded like that was something that was going to get taken care of. Uh, in the, our last meeting that was in person over the summer was, very, they were on board with us moving forward with this and were talking about what we needed to, how to verbally rewrite some things to get us to get us down this path. When we had a phone conversation with them uh, more in the October, November time frame, they wanted to go back to a different approach that matched much more on the CSO uh, standpoint. They, they, they told us to just slow down on the, what we were talking about and um, I'm not the person to have do do a conversation on the the order of the different things that they want to have done, but they just didn't seem as agreeable. And our best assumption on that is that the attorneys got involved and looked at what we what our current uh, orders were versus what was being talked about at a staff level, and said they they didn't like where it was headed. That's the best that we could assume now. Whether we can still get to where we want to go, um, our the attorney that we've worked with felt like there is, we can still move forward and get this to to get accomplished. It's just going to there are a lot more hoops that are going to be involved in the process, um, and it may not hurt to have him give a, an update or whether in person or through Nick mm -hmm. uh, to kind of get what at what you're asking about. But right now we don't have a clear path. And, you know, I have written in here that if we, the other path had a $100 million cost estimate with it, if we have to go down to the CSO, we may uh, go back to an approach that was used here in the past. I mean, we may have to. Um, we did, we weren't, the, the 100 plus million that's built in here was done by HR Green with the idea of getting to full separation where we are going to uh, use the, existing pipes for the storm water and then build a all new sanitary sewer pipes and that's how the locust basin has been done. Um, what we had done with a lot of our previous work was maintaining a lot of the infrastructure mm -hmm. and it's not really sized up to do what needs to be done in the long term. It's not the most effective but it's a lot cheaper and affordability is going to have to be part of that discussion and, and, and do some weight some trade-offs weighing off weighing which one is the best manner to move forward that's if they ha say that we have to hold closer to our existing time frame on the CSO work I mean our preference is to do it the way closer to what we're doing now but to do it in an order where we put in other things that need to be done along the way too uplifting yeah well, it's, it's that part of it is a yeah. discussion. You, well, there isn't a solution that there comes isn't. through this budget process. We, we move forward with, with a path, and it may, I, I think that on the, sewer, on the sewer side for that, that part of it, we have to know that that is something that may just, in a, we may find that six months or a year or farther down mm -hmm. the road that we just have to trash it and move a different direction. Sure. Just know that that's there. I hate to do that. We've spent a heck of a lot of money trying to get down that path. Well, I mean, the, the money that we spent to renegotiate, a lot of the planning that has gone on, was part of it was grant funded. Uh, we worked with uh, Environmental Protection Agency uh, to do some of that integrated planning, uh, at least the basis for it. And we've done, we have spent a few thousand since then, but 
the, it has, it's been more time that we've put into it than it's really been money uh, that's been invested. Well, but the sewer master plan was what, $500,000? That needed done regardless. But one of the driving factors was having that document yep. to get down this road. Yeah. Right. But it also identified, yeah, the order. I mean, from the integrated management plan, that document really helped as how, how do we prioritize which items should go first. And it makes, a, it makes an awful lot of sense for this is a roadmap for what we should do. But if we get hamstrung with what is required on the CSOs, mm. yeah. It's, from that perspective, yeah, there's some wasted money, but there's also, it, we know, it helped to identify what really needs done with our overall system. All right, overall wages, we don't have any agreements in place yet, but we used, we threw out a ballpark um, for a, a, at least for budgeting purposes, a 2.7% increase across the board on wages. Uh, in, that includes for our non-union personnel. Um, within the non-union personnel, we have a salary matrix. Uh, we did a bump of that full matrix 2% as well, which is one of the items on the next page. Uh, health insurance costs, based off of the language we have in union, uh, union contracts, uh, that has a cap on annual increases of 5% on average. Now, we banked close to 5% last year, so it could technically go up 10% this year and fall within that. But we look at over a period, over on an annual basis, that stair stepping up, uh, that max figure, 5% uh, annually. Um, the retirement plan for police and fire, MFP RSI. Municipal Fire Police Retirement or System of Iowa. Um, percentage went up this last year from 25.31 to 26.18 for the upcoming budget year. That eight, that increased our general fund costs by 55,000, just that change in percentage, without any look at what wages are going up. Uh, property liability insurance uh, went up it's been on a 10% annual increase, and we're budgeting for that to continue. Property tax assessed valuations, uh, the revenue based off of them increased 0.4% from last year, well below our what we've seen for average growth over the last decade, a two, little over 2%. Um, if we were seeing what we've seen, the average we've seen the last 10 years, our general fund would have had 175,000 new money this year, new money more than what we were able to look at uh, when we went into the budget cycle. Um, utilities, sanitation rates, we're proposing a 25 cent a month for each category of container, the 35, 65, and 95, that same thing we did last year. Uh, and that same 25 cent increase would be for any second or third containers that people may have on a monthly basis. Um, again, the Des Moines County solid waste this year is not increasing tipping fees, but they are continuing their pattern of the recycling fee going up uh, 10 cents per customer per month, which is part of our uh, bill. Mm -hmm. So 10 cents of the 25 cents is specifically to cover that recycling. Uh, stormwater rates uh, scheduled to increase 3% as our sewer, well, sewer rates is a little different. It's 3% for the non-metered accounts and 10% for metered accounts. We did a five-year agreement on, or rate resolution on that. The goal being at the end of five years, our 3%, or our non-metered and metered rate should be about equivalent for average water usage. The way the structures were done, they, there was a pretty good gap between the two. Well, that was to incentivize people to put in the meter, wasn't it? No. Before, I mean, originally. No, no, no. no. We, we weren't looking at providing any incentive for the, the meter. It's just I don't know why the rates were that far out of whack. They whack. just were. It's the equalization of the rates. So what we, essentially what we did is we looked at what our average revenue off of a 
a house that was metered, houses that were metered was versus what our average revenue was off of the non-metered. Mm -hmm. The goal of getting them to where it's, they would be more equivalent. All right. Behind that, the next sheet. When we talk about taxes, um, our property tax levy, uh, it's this year it's our current rate is 1634-ish. This is 90 cents less uh, for what we're proposing this year, 1544, just shy of 1544. We made the change. Um, we lowered the employee other employee benefits portion of the levy by 90 cents. So every other levy on that page, the regular general levy, uh, the transit levy, the auditorium support, uh, airport support, library support, self-insurance costs, all stayed the same. We made up the difference, that 90 cent difference right in the, in the one area. Where do we compare? The next page looks at our small group of seven cities in that 20 to 30,000 population range. Uh, so you look, Burlington has our, it shows for the current year our levy is 1634. For this group of seven cities, we're, be, we're already below average. We're also the highest TIF percentage user. We use more. We do more. Use more uh, leverage in tax increment finance debt than our core group. We are also bonded at a much higher levy. The 380 is well above the average. But so where we stand now below the average yet it's if you look at what when you look at what that average is Fort Dodge and Ottumwa really drive that awful high mm -hmm. um, this really puts us back a, a, a 90 cent decrease puts us in pretty well in line with what the majority of the cities in this core group is for total levy for total levy right. it's and distributions I mean you it's Every town does things a little differently, so looking at those is is rather hard to look at how different how levies are distributed. Um, what I would say is most of our stuff that we've had come back when when we have our bond ratings. They one of the concerns that gets raised by the rating agencies is the amount of debt that we carry and how how leveraged we are. And we are one of the, the higher debt carrying communities out there. Uh, we, we tend to use 60 to 70 percent of our debt capacity. Um, if you look at the next sheet of the towns that are over 20,000 population, if you were to look at what their debt usage was, out of this group of 22 cities, there are three or four of us who sit up at using, consistently using that much of our debt capacity. The others are well below that. I don't have that identified on this sheet. I've looked at, looked at it in the past. Um, when you look at where our levy sits here, uh, among the lar uh, this larger group of cities, the towns the 20 to um, 20,000 and above, um, our 1634 levy is well above, and even with the 90 cent drop, we're still a, a decent amount above. But we come in, we'll come in more in the center of that distribution of towns. So that I've, I like the I like to see us come in closer to that center. I think it's a good spot to be in. Um, it would be nice if we weren't so debt leveraged, but it's where we are. Um, and a, one of the things that I've pointed out in the past and can again, that taxable value per capita, uh, the f that's the fourth column over 
and we're at 30,145. The average of these towns is 50,000 of taxable valuation per person. Uh, we are, I think, the third lowest on this list, um, which means when we have a, a tax levy that is on the higher end, you look at the total tax that we actually collect per person, we're one of the lowest. We collect, there are, are uh, the average town, that's the column that, that shows that is the third from the right. Um, the average town collects $678 per person to fund their services. We have the same services that we have to provide and we do it at right at $500 per person. You can look at Dubuque as that is on, uh, on the low end of that. Uh, Marshalltown is down with them. Um, we are one of the lower ones on that list. And that's just what it basically says is that we are one of the, the valuation wise, we are one of the poorer communities property value wise in the state. And it makes it harder to fund operations. So for us to be able to provide quality services is more difficult and it takes more work on our part to do. And I will go through the next few sheets too before we stop. Um, when we get looking at some of the departments, you know, the departments will be presenting their budgets over the next few meetings. I wanted to highlight here, and you have them here, the gross revenues collected by the different, within the departmental areas. Um, the only one that I, well, I have two, a couple that are highlighted. Within the fire department, you can see two different dynamics going on. One is they had a safer grant in fire control that they were using to pay for officers, and that is disappearing. So their revenue in fire control is going down significantly. But on the ambulance side, their revenues collected is going up significantly, and that's a ground emergency medical transport. Um, that we get. 700,000 out of that. We also pay 250,000 back to them somewhere in that neighborhood. So it's worked. That has been a significant benefit. It's, it's helped to more than offset the loss in revenue uh, from the safer grant. Mm -hmm. Looking at the next page, the only other item that, that has seen a funda fundamental change in revenue under tran public transit here. Uh, we were sh budgeting 990,000 for revenue in 20, 2020, and we're proposed revenue collections this next year will be uh, 1.2 million. And that is the res largely the result of CARES Act. Uh, the CARES Act provided a significant amount of funds to us. Uh, we had 1.3 million. Uh, we have out of that 1.3 million that was provided to us, I <clears throat> want to say that 800,000 or so was set aside to fund operations. Um, it and you'll this is I think represents maybe 150,000 going into it uh, out of that fund to cover this next year's operations. Um, but that's a give or take. Um, Depending on what we have for transit fares revenue, uh, if transit fare revenue r remains low, uh, this is a, that CARES funding is kind of a stopgap that we can collect more to help to offset the costs there. Um, we were able to add a position here uh, because we have this funding stream. This funding stream is something that should be good for funding that position, I would say, three years. At that point, there will be a decision that will have to be made about what, what does it mean long term for, for the operation. Um, and net revenue, uh, that net revenue row near the bottom is netting revenues against expenses in the budgets. Uh, we had in the fiscal 20 budget uh, 50,000 um, as our budgeted net revenue. Our actuals came in around 
I want to say around 20,000, but um, it's been a while since I looked at that. Um, I'm sorry, 13,000, it's right there. Um, we budgeted for 21 to have 7,000 net revenue and budgeting for in what's being proposed uh, to you uh, tonight and over the next few weeks, a net revenue of, of $1,300. Not a large amount on a fund that has 22 plus million in it of expenditures. When you look at the expenditures on the next page, what I highlighted was where was where we saw uh, some any of the significant changes that that occurred. Um, fire control is up 170 thousand. Ambulance is up five five hundred fifty thousand. That's and that's a two-year budget cycle. The majority uh, on the fire control is going to be essentially wages and benefits. Mm -hmm. um, ambulance cost will be that plus we have the $250,000 or so GM, GMT administration fee that they charge us before we net out. Plus, two people. plus yeah, we moved a couple of people from fire control over to ambulance or actually out of administration. Dana's got moved over, and the part-time billing person. Um, police department you can see patrol investigations up three hundred thousand, and again, a lot of that is wages and benefits and debt. And then communications goes from six hundred ninety thousand to zero. That's the change in how DESCOM is funded. It's no longer through us. And it, those changes what's happened on the funding side for GEMT in the ambulance and then what's happened with taking DESCOM off has kind of flipped the percentage of general fund expenses uh, where it used to be that the police department was a little bit larger portion of the general fund it's now switched over to the ambulance so ambulance is what we're saying is more expensive than police now or fire is more expensive than police Wow. We say page. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, if you look at the total, I mean, historically, about 60% of the general fund is police and fire. And we're main, it's, that's staying the same as we move forward. Uh, auditorium, you see down a significant amount. And that kind of reflects the change in contract. We were able, they were willing to come to us with a adjusted contract that stair step down support level. And that's reflected in the budget, and it's very appreciated as we try to, um, you know, be able to cash flow these items. Um, the next page, the, on the only one that saw a significant change in public works is transit. And that, besides general costs going up, we do have an extra position that's built into that. And I know I didn't go line by line out of what is funded out of the general fund, but this, these two pages tell you what is funded out of the general fund. Um, it falls into uh, emergency services and fire and police, uh, the development department, which is all Eric, culture and rec, which is Rhonda for the library, and the rest being Eric. Um, you have some human services costs, but then the primary things is public works and the administrative functions. All right. And I think that can be an, enough for tonight. If you have, that's, we, this isn't designed to go really in depth. It's just mm -hmm. designed to get, give you give somewhat you an of an overview. Again, we, we have on the, on the general fund is the primary area of concern for making sure that we have a budget that's presented that is balanced, and this is. Um, and the different departments will get into what they have for expenditures. Uh, possibly I'll do kind of what I did last, last year. We did a midterm checkup 
well, we don't have that many different budget sessions this time, so we might do some of those kind of pie graph looks later on or near the end of next Wednesday when we have every all the departments presented. Okay. And we will go through the CIP tomorrow along with Rhonda and possibly, are you up tomorrow? Too? Rhonda and Waste. So. Library and Waste, sorry, Don. Um, sorry, fitting, fitting, fitting and Rhonda, sorry. So just for your frame of reference, behind what we did cover, there is a general booklet. Uh, this, the League of Cities puts out a budget special report um, that you certainly are more than welcome to look through. If you see something in there that call, calls a question of mine, please let either Stephanie or myself know. Uh, we can go try to answer whatever you have for questions that are in there. And we'll go, th yeah, behind that is the CIP, and we'll get to that next time. All right. Thank you, Jim. Uh, moving on to the proposed regular agenda, uh, January 19, 2021, public hearing consideration of an ordinance amending Section 1, Legal Description, and Section 5, Land Use and Design Requirements, of ordinance number 3217 of ordinance creating Fun City Plan Unit Development PUD Overlay District first reading. Uh, so this PUD was created uh, back when Fun City um, kind of came to be what it is now along with the casino site. Uh, so the Fun City PUD covers both lots, the casino site and the Fun City site. Um, they've requested uh, some minor amendments to it, um, one being the uh, Legal description, uh, looking to uh, modify the property line just north of the industry building to uh, take in some of that land into the Fun City PUD. Uh, the primary changes would be under land use, uh, looking to add in uh, major event entertainment as an allowed use, uh, which would include auditoriums, uh, meeting areas, and sports arenas. Um, they're looking to add in uh, the courts, the indoor basketball courts at this facility, uh, kind of the second phase of the turf facility uh, that's out near the recplex, the uh, indoor uh, soccer field. This would be four uh, full size or collegiate sized uh, basketball courts uh, on the back side of the uh, hotel there, the Fun City Pizzazz Hotel, and then tying into the Wine Guard Manufacturing Building as well, creating a zero lot line development there. Um, so uh, under our code now, uh, sports arenas at major event entertainment uh, requires a special use permit, so this would just make an allowed use, so they wouldn't have to go to the zoning board every five years for renewal. Okay. Um, parking areas uh, with this, uh, this will affect some parking in this area. Um, the current count out there, they have added some parking in front of the casino site. Um, so the current count is roughly 1,165 parking spaces. Uh, this PUD would make that, uh, I guess, the required number of spaces um, in discussion. Uh, as I should say, this went to the Planning Commission last week. They recommended approval four to zero with one abstain. Uh, the abstention was uh, uh, Brian Bross is with Klingner and Associates who's doing some work on the project. So um, they felt uh, this was a good, a good project. But uh, with the manufacturing, uh, there is some additional parking on that site that uh, could be used for overflow parking as well. And then depending on long-term use of the site, whether uh, it continues forward with manufacturing, most of their manufacturing is moved to the facility north of Mount Pleasant. Uh, this potentially could be a parking lot down the road if the uh, need is there as well, uh, just or a portion of it could be. Um, the final uh, item would be building setbacks. Currently, the PUD says uh, interior streets does not require setback. Um, I think that's just a language uh, item. Uh, there are no interior streets within the Fun City PUD, but uh, this would allow that exterior street to have zero setback uh, going up to the property line there. So, um, so that's the, the plan uh, that they're looking to move forward is uh, the four indoor courts at the, this facility. Okay. Any questions, gang? Sweet. So when would that be finished or proposed? Uh, they're looking to start uh, this spring yet, so I guess it depends on timing. They have individuals lined up, and they'll uh, have representatives at the council meeting uh, probably online to talk about any other questions. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Uh, next up is uh, public hearing consideration of an ordinance amending Section B, Land Use Design Criteria, Ordinance Number 3104, for the Burlington Senior Living Campus PUD first reading. 
Uh, these are the, I guess, currently called the views properties out on uh, West Avenue uh, and uh, Indian Hills Drive. Um, they've gone through some, I guess, some survey work on the property and found that uh, the back side of this uh, northern building uh, doesn't meet our current zoning code setbacks. It was uh, rezoned to a PUD back when they were developed. Uh, there was an associated plan with it that was approved. Uh, the plan showed uh, the current setback and was allowed to move forward. So it's kind of more of a thing where it's uh, not conforming under our, technically under our code and they're just wanting to make that so it's not a non-conforming use. Uh, so it just makes that 15 foot setback on the south side of this northern lot, uh, what the actual setback is and that's what it's measured at. Uh, they own both properties and there's over 100 feet between the buildings so it's not an issue on our end. Okay, any uh, questions, gang? Planning Commission again recommended four to zero to approve this. I figured so. that, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Eric. And the next one after that is a motion. To, why don't you just stay yeah. there? Motion for a preliminary adoption of the second reading of the ordinance amending section 155.03, sections amended of chapter 155, International Building Code of the Burlington Municipal Code. Uh, so, no changes from previous reading on this. This was the allowed openings on alley and street sides so that windows could be on. Uh, especially on alley sides uh, where they have greater than 10 feet of clearance and there's a public space there that they can put windows in new buildings uh, primarily affects the downtown buildings where there uh, isn't there is built environment around them so uh, with the tame building and the merge building this would allow uh, windows and openings on some of those sides that wouldn't be allowed currently under the international building code okay so as previously discussed is anybody with me that we want to waive the third reading Yes, so let's make that happen. Uh, thank you, Eric. Number four, resolution of fun, approving fund transfers for the fiscal year 2021. Stephanie. So last year, during the budget process, we did a resolution approving the interfund transfers for the fiscal year. We're currently in 21. Um, this resolution is a continuation of that. These are um, transfers that have come up that we'd like to make um, that weren't in the original resolution. So we'll just briefly go through them. Um, Jim kind of went through some of them too. Um, that first one is um, a general fund reimbursement for the flood expenditures that might not be covered. Again, that one we won't make until we get closer to year end and we see um, when we get all the insurance proceeds and, and the FEMA reimbursements. So it's kind of an, an estimate amount, up to amount. Um, the other one is um, our lost, you know, collections are more this year. So we're going to, to meet that, our rule of 50% gets transferred into the general fund. I have to increase that transfer. Um, the next one is the million dollars for the flood wall um, being um, over that budget and the uh, the next one is a sales tax um, transfer to cover um, the pool project, a pool project that we want to get done this year. Um, and then the next two, oh, go ahead. No, I thought somebody said something. Um, are transferring from hotel, motel, direct plex, and golf course um, for the increase in operating de deficits that we didn't have budgeted. They're, you know, they're more this year, so we want to get those amounts transferred in. Um, then the second to last one is transferring the money for to pay the Burlington Junction Railroad for the flood protection project, 170,000. And then the last one, um, basically we have a capital project um, fund that has this $667,000 in it. That's the amount we'd set aside to um, use for the Valley parking lot. And this is just mm -hmm. transferring it into the correct account. But just to make it clear, we're transferring that balance into another one to cover those expenses. And then, like Jim said, if we still need more, we can. We might have another transfer there. Yeah. Does anybody okay. have any questions? Or? No questions. Robert, you have a question? Robert might. He might be asleep. Anyway. Yeah. Robert, okay. Oh, you muted yourself. All right. Thanks, Robert. Good to know you're still with us. Uh, up is the proposed consent agenda. First up is a resolution. Approving the purchase of a civic or a city light duty bus for Burlington Urban Service. You going to take that one, Jim? Sure. Out of the mention, the CARES funding that we had the 1.3 million. We did set aside part. Part of that was set aside specifically for capital equipment, 
one of the items was this bus. We'd set aside ninety five, ninety six thousand for it. The purchase actually is just under ninety thousand. Uh, this is done through the state bid, um, so recommend moving forward and getting it. Okay. Any questions, through. gang? No, thank you, Jim. Uh, second for the proposed consent is resolution approving federal aid agreement for Iowa's transportation alternatives program, Iowa's TAP project uh, or project the state Re recreational trails program. RT uh, between the Iowa Department of Transportation and the City of Burlington. Eric, uh, this is their s the standard form with the DOT when we're using uh, funds uh, that go through them. That uh, kind of just goes over the expenditure funds and how those uh, funds should be used and reimbursement. Um, we did receive a, a TAP grant um, of three hundred thousand for this project, and then a state rec trail grant in the amount of one hundred sixty-five thousand for this project. And this is the uh, remaining gap on the Flint River Trail on Bluff Road. So this red portion here um, in front of the former uh, Lamont uh, going up to Cass Street, uh, there's a gap there. So that will substantially complete our trail so you can go from downtown out around Case and up to Tamer Road uh, completely off-road. Off so Sweet. Um, this is the last remaining portion uh, that we've been working on quite a while. Okay. Thank you, sir. Oh, I forgot to any questions again. All right. Uh, next one up is a resolution approving the conflict waiver with Lynch Dallas PC. Does that pertain to the school thing? Yes, it does. Okay. We don't need to discuss it. I nope. think we're all right there. Good. And number four, set a date for the public hearing February 1st, 2021. Considerations of plans and specifications for t Harrison Avenue reconstruction project 2021. Is there any future discussion items? Eric? At a set date, we did just receive plans and specs for the pool deck project. Um, so we want to add that as a set date for hearing on the, those plans and specs and just got those today. So. Okay. Sounds good. Uh, Mr. Fitting, do you have anything? No. All right. No. Matt? No. Stephanie? Jim? Anything left? All right. Thank you, everybody. It's a long meeting. I appreciate your patience and, and participation. Let's get out of here. Hey. Yeah. What? How you feeling? Talk to you.